With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gelb, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to get notifications of great new interviews. Also, please leave comments. Great news, you can now watch our full-length documentary, Open Your Eyes, on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube movies and shows. In 2021, over 800,000 Americans had laser refractive surgery, but millions more are interested. According to the American Academy of Ophthalmology, it is estimated that about 43 million Americans are candidates for refractive surgery. Today's guest, Illinois optometrist, Dr. Vincent Brandes, is a popular refractive surgery, surgery lecturer and educator. Dr. Brandes will share which patients are best candidates for refractive surgery, as well as different types of refractive surgery options. Dr. Brandes is currently the president of Stingray Strategies, a consulting group with a focus on the ophthalmic industry and government relations. Dr. Brandes, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Carrie. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, let's get right into it. There are about 3 million contact lens dropouts every year. Is that because people are having side effects to contacts or is it because maybe they, they're getting older, they don't want to wear contacts anymore, they, it's easier for them to wear their glasses? What do you think the reason for that is? Well, I think let's start out with the, with the first caveat that a lot of Americans or a lot of people around the globe don't really understand, at least in our country, they're medical devices. Contact lenses are not a commodity. It's not something that should be considered lightly. So when a patient gets fit in a contact lens, it's the eye care provider's job to make sure that they understand and educate the patient as to what they're getting into. Contact lenses have been used for 50 years and the soft lens industry pretty much has revolutionized the uh, contact lens wearing with silicon hydrogel. So a lot of Americans are doing quite well in contacts, but it's almost like their options they feel are limited and oh my gosh, I don't want to go back to wearing my glasses. Uh, how long can I continue to wear these contacts? And you're right, as we get older, there's issues with our health, peer layer, medications, all com combined make sometimes contact lens wearing not the ideal situation. Now, I personally wear contacts, and I know you're a practicing optometrist. You have many people that wear contacts, and people love contact lenses. You know, there's what about 40, 45 million people in the U.S. that wear contact lenses, but there, you know, but some people have something called contact lens intolerance. If you could define what that is. Well, not only am I here on your podcast talking about it from the doctor point of view, provider point of view, I can tell you from the patient point of view. Uh, I'm 59 years old. When I was 35, I had severe contact lens intolerance. Um, I had the old PMMA lenses, then I went into gas burns, and then I tried soft toric. Silicon hydrogel was not an option back then, but I just couldn't get comfortable wear. Um, I, when I would play golf, I would actually bring my glasses or wear my glasses to the golf course, bring my contacts, put them in the locker room, play five hours, take them immediately out. So LASIK was just, PRK was out and LASIK was just getting off uh, in its uh, infancy in the late 90s. 
And so I was able to uh, get LASIK and I had monovision LASIK even back, uh, back then. And my vision today is still very consistent and stable. Uh, my script was uh, like a minus 650, minus two sill in both eyes. So for me, it was an option that as the provider and also a patient, I no longer wanted to wear contacts because the comfort level was not something I was able to achieve more than four or five hours. So you had a, a moderate prescription for people that aren't in the vision community. So you said minus 650, that's a fairly moderate prescription. And you wound up having monovision done with refractive surgery, or in your case, you had LASIK. Explain what monovision is. So monovision is typically done once the patient has some issues with the lens of their eye as they get into their late 30s and early 40s. It's called presbyopia. It's the inability to read things up close the eye can't accommodate. So if you're a nearsighted person, since you were a teenager, it's a very strange for you because your whole life, you know, this was good, that wasn't. And now you hit 45, let's say you're a systems analyst, and now you're having to push things farther away more so with your contacts on than even your glasses, because you can adjust the glasses off your face. And so you're like, wait a minute, why do I all of a sudden not see up close? So there's a lot of confusion when that happens. So what I did on uh, the advice of my surgeon was to try monovision, which was one lens, my non-dominant uh, eye, which was my left eye for up close viewing. And my distance eye, uh, my right eye was, uh, was refracted that way and also laser uh, corrected that way. But I wasn't truly presbyopic yet, but my surgeon convinced me that when I get there, you're gonna be able to not wear glasses for a long time. And I mentioned how old I was earlier, but I went to about my middle fifties without needing any help. And even today I can see much, uh, almost everything, a little extra light of course, uh, but I finally got my first progressive uh, at 55. So I, I was very lucky that the monovision lasted that long. I don't think that's a common um, period of time. Most people don't get that many years in monovision. They're gonna need some help. And of course, with contact lenses, we induce monovision. So for me, it was something that I was a little resistant on, but my surgeon convinced me it would be something I would benefit from down the road. And I, I think it is a uh, option that all patients should talk about their, uh, talk to their eye care provider about. And did you have any problems with monovision adapting? And when you fit patients with contact lenses with monovision, how do they typically do? Now, we, of course, we have multifocal contact lenses, and usually that's our first option. But sometimes we do have to use monovision, whether it's in surgery or in contact lenses. And just from an experience point of view, how do you feel patients usually do with monovision? Well, actually, just yesterday, Carrie, I had a patient in my office who failed in multifocal. And she was wearing um, two multifocals, a uh, 52-year-old woman who was a is a hairstylist. And so we, we talked about doing something that I call pseudo monovision. So what I did is I kept the multifocal in her non-dominant eye, and I put a distance lens in her right eye. And immediately, right in the chair, she was amazed that she could see. Because of her profession, it's something where she could do both things at the arm's distance as she's you know, cutting hair and, and doing her job and felt that she wanted to try this. So monovision can be done different ways. Um, I actually had a patient who was a museum curator. I'll never forget this person. He would wear two distance lenses to work, to commute to his job. And then he would put in two reading lenses to do his small work as a curator. And then when he wanted to go out on the weekends, he would wear one distance and one near. That's a highly uh, unusual example. But a lot of times monovision can give that patient best of both worlds. When I first got it, um, I used to joke that uh, my buddies had to give me extra strokes on the golf course because it did throw off my depth and my putting. Um, but it took a while. And once I got into my you know, 39, 40 years of age, it really uh, showed the benefit of it. And I, and I thank my surgeon almost daily when I don't have to put on a pair of cheaters to uh, look at my phone. So what are some of the ways that we could use to fight contact lens intolerance? Well, first of all, you have to look uh, or work with your provider on your health history. So if you are 
at any age, if you're on certain medications, make sure your eye care provider knows about your medical history and the medications you're on. And even over-the-counter supplements, that is something I will say in my 32 years, I've seen a, a tremendous increase in the American public using more supplements, uh, vitamins and, and uh, shakes and other types of ways that they are trying to you know, improve their health. So make sure you review that with your provider so they have a better idea as to what you're doing on a daily basis. But typically it's the medications, your health, and the biggest thing I find is your work environment or your daily environment. You know, if you're a, a concrete uh, construction worker versus a nurse or a landscaper, those are all different. And those individuals, you may think, oh, the contact lens intolerance person would be the construction worker. Not necessarily, it just depends on how healthy that person is and what medications they may be taking. Let me give you an example. If I'm talking about that construction worker um, and they're uh, on levothyroxine, they have uh, issues with their eyes drying at the end of the day, they may abuse the contacts to an extent of wearing them longer because in their job, they don't wanna have to wear contacts, I'm sorry, prescription safety glasses. They're already wearing safety glasses over their contacts. So when they're talking about that to you um, as a provider, the doctor must educate the patient as well as here's what we can do to help minimize contact lens intolerance. And of course, we can do that by switching different materials, using different solutions, and also adding to the tear layer before you put your contacts in with an artificial lubricant. And a lot of people have side effects from the contact lenses or a little bit of contact lens intolerance, and they just kind of accept it. Yeah, because if they're a high nearsighted person, their options are wear their thick glasses, even though they might get the high index lens, the peripheral vision might be a little distorted from wearing glasses. And let's face it, most people pr would prefer to wear their contacts if they could. Now, the timing of it, though, sometimes is what frustrates the patient. Uh, we talked about multifocal lenses. Those lenses work great, but their contact lens intolerance, I think a lot of providers and maybe patients will think, Intolerance, that means they're uncomfortable. True, but intolerance also could be frustrations with fluctuating in vision. So whether it's a auric lens or even a multifocal lens, even if it's a daily lens, if their vision isn't consistent, they're gonna be frustrated when they go from their work to the store, to the restaurant, and they have to either use cheaters or pull out their phone and add light to it because they're intolerant on wearing them and the only thought that would be is, oh gosh, at least I don't have to go back to wear my glasses. So I think we really need to work together, patient and provider, to see in their average day, are they really happy? Are they contact lens intolerant with comfort and also vision? And let's talk about some of the side effects that we see with contact lenses. We know that millions of people wear contact lenses without side effects, but just like anything, uh, there are side effects. Let's start off with hypoxia. What is it and what can it do, what can it do to the eye? Uh, hypoxia is a reduction of oxygen to the surface of the cornea. The cornea is a transparent covering over your iris. And the cornea has several layers. And if you're wearing a lens, let's say it's a, it's a daily lens. And believe it or not, patients wear daily lenses multiple days. Do not do that. That's bad but patients do, uh, whether it's economic or maybe the provider didn't explain it well enough. But when you overwear your lenses, or even if you have an approved night and day type of lens, by wearing that lens, you may deprive the eye of oxygen. And again, depending on your health, depending on how thick the contact lens is, you may not realize you're getting hypoxia. And one of the symptoms from the patient point of view that you may see is halos around lights at night, or a little glare or flare around a street light, or even at home looking at the TV and it's not really crisp and sharp. And you think, oh, I've only had these lenses in for 14 hours. Or if it's a two week lens, I've only had them on, uh, this is my third day. Why am I not seeing really well? Well, you have to review with the provider and the patient to say, well, where did you wear them? How long have you been wearing them? and what else is going on in your life that could be causing it. Hypoxia is something that's very sneaky. It, it kind of uh, doesn't be, it's not really obvious to the patient, 
And when they come in for an exam, we can identify it and we wanna educate them that we don't wanna have this continuous because if it is, it's going to cause permanent damage to their cornea. So when people sleep, even without contact lenses, their eye could swell about 5%. And some people wake up and they say, you know, my vision's blurry for a short time when I wake up. Can you comment on that? Absolutely. I happen to uh, live with someone, my wife, who doesn't wear contacts, and she has to reach. First thing she does in the morning is she grabs her bottle of artificial tears to re-wet her eyes. She suffers from dry eye syndrome, um, and she's on other medications to help her with that. But it doesn't mean because you're a contact lens wearer, you're the only one who could get hypoxia. You know, there's been studies out there for years of patients wearing rigid or, you know, the old days of, of PMA lenses, the old hard lenses, having long-term effects of that, corneal warpage. So hypoxia is something that is not, again, something that the patient really considers, but they have symptoms. And when they talk to their provider, we need to identify that and help them diminish it as much as we can. And how about flying? Because when you fly, you have lack of oxygen. And how about pilots? You know, what does it mean to pilots when they're flying? Uh, well, uh, altitude has a, a big issue or problem uh, with uh, hypoxia and contact lens use. So, you know, there are colleagues of ours who are in higher altitudes where they practice. Um, in Denver, for example, versus maybe New Orleans, sea level will definitely make a difference in, in how your eyes react. Um, and it's for the person maybe who changes altitudes. They're in the Midwest, they go skiing, and they're at that higher altitude. Well, forget just the plane ride, but now they're, you know, people get altitude sickness um, in, in physically, but it does affect their eyes. And so what I'll do a lot of times, if I know that I have an avid skier as a patient, I will suggest that they uh, use daily lenses and just give them some daily trials for their ski trip because they may start to develop that. And again, depending on how, how healthy they are, um, what their medications may be, that all factors into um, altitude at, at, uh, in, in a plane, but also altitude where you may um, you know, live and also um, have some fun skiing. What's interesting is when there's lack of oxygen to the cornea, we get a buildup of lactic acid and that actually draws fluid into the cornea. Yes, and a lot of times that fluid is the culprit not a lot of times, most of the time, that's the fluid that causes this halo or glare that we see. Um, and again, it's something that's preventable if we tell the patient that you need to make sure that maybe this lens has worked for you for 15 years. And you have to be, from the provider point of view, gentle. People don't like to be told they're getting older. Uh, so you try to find a way where you can help them by maybe switching materials or finding a different way to make sure that they aren't getting hypoxia or minimizing the, its effects. And is hypoxia worse with gas permeable lens or, or hydrogel soft contact lenses? <laughs> well, that's a great question. It depends on how compliant our patients are, right? Um, in, in general, the silicon hydrogel lens uh, should be a better fit, um, but you know, gas perms are, are, so a rigid gas perm lens is complete plastic. A silicon hydrogel has a matrix of plastic with silicone in it, um, different than the old uh, first generation of, of soft contact lenses, uh, an AccuView 2, for example, versus the AccuView Oasis. So I haven't fit a gas perm in a while, and the reason is silicon hydrogel lenses are just more comfortable. The patients love the fit, and they get longer extended wear than they ever could with a gas perm. But you get those loyal, rigid lens wearers, and you try to talk to them and say, hey, let's get you in a newer material. They're very resistant to that. And single use contact lenses are now are taking over, you know, because they're more convenient, they're safer, and uh, the side effects are less, where probably you know, there's been studies that show that maybe less than 1% or 1% of the people have any kind of keratitis or any kind of corneal problem from uh, single use contact lenses where some of the ones that people sleep with, it's up to 20%. If you could comment on the difference between single use and lenses that you have to clean, whether typically it's two week or one month in the US, maybe in other countries, it's one week, you could comment on that. Sure, again, I, I mentioned this earlier, it just goes back to compliance. So we might assume that a construction worker 
in the, his or her dirty environment may be the, the more likely candidate to have a keratitis or God forbid an ulcer versus, excuse me, someone who is uh, in a clean environment like uh, an architect. I think the level of compliance using the solutions, pro appropriately rinsing your case, changing solutions, not substituting solutions. If your provider says to use this particular solution, that's something that you should stick with. Uh, and if you want to buy a cheaper version, be aware that the preservative in it and the actual chemical that is disinfecting it is different than the other one. Otherwise, there'd be patent infringement. So companies can't do that. They have different chemicals. And so it's inherent to save money, especially these days with inflation. You don't want to grab the cheapest version. You want to make sure that it's going to work well. And there's been some studies that show certain lenses don't work well with certain solutions. So when you're trying to keep your eyes healthy, extended wear lenses, if worn correctly and in, in typically clean environments, if they're doing what the provider says, it's safe and effective. I personally, as a provider, don't like fitting younger people in general. Um, I don't have a hard cut age, but just talking to the patient. We can tell as a provider, if you're someone who's going to A, pay attention and, and follow instructions, or B, by their physical demeanor and their overall personal hygiene. You can tell if someone's not going to do what you ask if they're the not cleanest person in the world. That's not someone you want to put in the extended wear lens. MacU Health, your science born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. You mentioned a little bit about low humidity before as a, could be a, a, could be a reason for a contact lens intolerance. Iran has a city in Iran that has the the lowest humidity in the whole on the whole planet Earth. And then we have states such as Nevada and Colorado and Arizona and Wyoming uh, that have very low humidity where people may have trouble wearing contact lenses. Explain where, if it's very, the humidity is very low, why that would cause people to have trouble wearing contacts. So there's no, so we talked earlier about the gas perm lens where we're talking about soft silicon hydrogel lenses it's a difference of the matrix of plastic, silicon plastic, and water. When water dehydrates and water leaves the lens, specifically as you're wearing that lens per day longer, but also if it's a 30-day lens, you're at day 27 and day 29, you're going to have that low humidity causing more of a problem to desiccate and dry the contact, but also the, the eye itself. Um, a lot of these individuals, when they take their contacts out, they'll feel their eyes are drier than when they had them in. And so their concern is what's causing that, the contact. And sometimes it's, again, best to rehydrate your lenses before you take them out. Sometimes patients in that environment can actually scratch their eye by taking their lens out, thinking it's ready to come out, but it's actually sticking to its front surface. And when the contact lens starts to dry out, the edges start to curl in and you could almost feel that it's, it's pinching. And there's a lot of people, once they kind of get to that point where the contact lens is too dry, it might be toward the end of the day. And even if they rehydrate it with drops, it doesn't seem to help. The only thing that helps is actually removing the lens and if they're using a daily or a single use lens of throw, is throwing it out. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think we need as providers to re-educate our patients on this. Okay, a daily lens is obviously, as we said, a daily. But if you're giving a patient a two-week lens or a monthly lens, and they tell you that they can't get 30 days or they can't get 14 days, that's a tip off to you, the, the doctor, to say, maybe we should try a daily lens. Or if you're in a 30, maybe we should try a two-week lens. Or sometimes, depending upon seasons, um, if the person's very uh, outdoorsy and they, and they camp a lot, you'll tell them when you do your, your camping trip to you know, the Grand Canyon, you may not get two weeks out of that contact lens. Again, I would give them dailies for that trip. But in general, just because the FDA said certain lens last two weeks, you may not get that. And sometimes we know patients will stretch their lenses. And in my experience, it's the patient who stretches with that uh, is begging for a problem. Uh, last 
Tuesday. Uh, this is one I don't think I've ever had before. I had a teenager, 16 year old, who I saw the year before and I know what lens we put in and he was wearing. And I looked at him before he took them out. And I said, where did you get this lens from? Now I thought he bought it on, online. Uh, and he, he said, no, I didn't buy it online. I said, well, that's not the lens I fit you in. He said, yeah, I know I ran out. I'm using my mother's. Mm -hmm. And I didn't fit the mother. So I, obviously I knew something was wrong, but you know, you want to ask the patient, well, why did you do that? Why didn't you come in? We, we would give you trial. So I said, what happened? He goes, well, doc, I'm not wearing my glasses. I'm a senior in high school. I'm not going to put glasses on. So this guy was over wearing his contacts because he didn't want to come in for his exam or maybe it was an insurance issue, but he was wearing his mother's contacts. And of course it confused me because his acuity was off because he was wearing the wrong power, but it was close enough so much so that he didn't want to wear his glasses. Yeah, the, 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 it's amazing the the ingenuity of patients, what they're what they're able to do, and things that they think of to be able to continue to wear contact lenses because they don't want to wear spectacles. Well, and I, I wanted to ask the young man, wait till your mother finds out, uh, <laughs> because a she's not going to be happy with you. B now she's short on her supply because <laughs> you took some of her lenses, but. Um, we refit him and he, he now has a better understanding of what he should do when he runs short of contacts. And I, I, I know he doesn't wanna wear contact, but let me quickly say what I do to all patients, but specifically teenagers, and this guy was a perfect example. I said to him, when you get older, in a few years from now, let's talk about refractive surgery options. There's a new procedure out there called SMILE. So by putting that in there, or if the mom's in the room, in this case, she wasn't, you know, letting the parents know that contact lens intolerance may happen at some point. It may not happen at 21, but at least the, the patient understands he may have an option uh, and glasses are not the fallback always, that refractive surgery is an option. So by letting them know that it's out there for them, uh, they may not think, no one ever told me I was a candidate and I didn't do a pre-op evaluation, obviously, but I always mention it to patients who I know are potential candidates just based on their refractive error. You know, and getting back to what contact lens getting dry, you know, there, there's usually a reason why people have dryness with their contact lenses. They may have poor nutrition. They may be dehydrated. They're not drinking enough fluids. And I've seen, you know, people who drink two or three cups of coffee a day and, and then we increase the amount of water they use. And we'll actually tell them to, you, you put frozen blueberries in the water to make the water more like gel so they could absorb it better. Uh, one, of the, one of the podcasts I did with an expert on water, Dr. Gerald Pollack, and he talked about how to make the water more like gel for people that don't absorb the water and the people that eat a lot of processed foods. So they also, may, their contact lens may dry out. It, like you said, it could be medication, could be hormonal related when it comes to dryness. So, you know, it, it, a lot of times it's not just you know, my eyes are dry, you know, just take this drop. And if you could comment on that. Oh, absolutely. What we ingest has a different, uh, definite effect on our vision. So again, even though we're talking about contact lens intolerance, it's patients that have severe dry eye wear glasses or post-op patients who've had refractive surgery as they get older, their eyes get drier. Um, let's step back for a minute though, Carrie, and, and talk about the tear layer itself. So the tear layer sits on our cornea. It's the transparent covering of the colored part of our eyes, the iris. Well, there's three layers. There's an oil layer that's on the exterior, closest uh, to the environment. Then there's a watery layer, that's the thickest. And then there's the mucin layer that's on the front surface of, of the cornea, on the epithelium. Well, what happens with that is we as providers look for two things. We look for tear quality and tear quantity. And we'll do diagnostic testing. We might use a little drop of a, a orange color, a sodium fluorescein. We might use uh, lysamine green. Uh, back in the day, I haven't used it in a long time, rose bengal, a uh, redder color uh, dye. So we're trying to evaluate that so you, the patient, understands we're trying to see where the deficiency is. So if it's an oil deficiency, um, a lot of doctors prescribe omega-3s, uh, or they'll also tell their patients to be aware of you know, certain foods that are high in omega-3 foods. 
um, and also foods that are not so good for you, like omega-6, like processed foods, like you mentioned. So the oil layer, I personally think is the trickiest layer to deal with because once that evaporates, it splits, the water comes out, the mucin gets all uh, uh, messed up and the patient gets a lot of discharge. So we wanna educate the patient that their consumption, you mentioned caffeine, uh, one of my concerns, and I talk to uh, younger people about this because it just seems they're the ones drinking it, is the energy drinks. They're loaded with caffeine and other substances that are just desiccating our eyes. And so those are the ones where I have my staff do a intake form. And we added this a couple years ago about asking about energy drinks and what they're taking. And some folks, you know, especially if they're active and they, and they do a lot of uh, 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 long-term driving and they wanna be awake, you know, they'll also add like five hour energy into their water. I mean, it's, it can be really bad for them and maybe they don't know it. I mean, they, they didn't realize that there's a cause and effect why my contacts all of a sudden aren't as comfortable. It could be the fact that they've had three monsters uh, before noon. I mean, that's a, that's a great point. It really is because, uh, you know, you get a, a 30 year old person, they shouldn't have dry eyes. Exactly. And that's, so it's, well, how's this happening? You know, and so you educate them that, well, this is why it's happening. And maybe they, they don't listen to you, but you make it aware. So maybe the next time they're in the store, they second guess that judgment on, on that. I'm, I don't want to get off on a tangent. Um, I don't, I'm not a big fan of energy drinks. I, I think there's a lot of cardiac and other issues that, you know, are beyond our professional scope that I think is something that there's better ways to increase your body's energy and um, consuming those products. So let's talk about some adverse effects uh, related to contact lenses. Let's talk about infection and the dreaded corneal ulcer. So the level of swelling, we talked about that with hypoxia, is a precursor to infection. And not getting into our, our days in uh, optometry uh, college and, and undergrad about uh, gram positive and gram negative, uh, but there are different types of bacteria. Some work in an anoxic or an, a grow and, and prosper in an, an environment that has no air or oxygen. And then some are, you know, grow in a, a different way. And so we also talk about uh, infections that can be parasitic, it could be viral. Uh, there's all sorts of nasty germs out there that we come in contact with that we may not know. And so with an ulcer, most providers assume it's, excuse me, bacterial. And they'll appropriately either dilate the eye or look at it with a slit lamp and put some stain in the eye and see exactly how thick it is, how long it's been there. In most cases, 90%, at least in my career, it's because they slept in their contact lenses. I personally have never seen an ulcer in a patient who didn't wear contacts. I'm sure it exists somewhere, but I haven't seen them. Um, and so I think we, we just, again, need to, I used to, in my younger days, get a little more aggressive with patients with an ulcer. You know, you, you kind of almost insult their intelligence. They know, they know they shouldn't have done that. They know that they were sleeping in their contacts, whether it was a college kid who had a crazy night out, out um, with his buddies or someone who, you know, could be a, a mom who's been uh, taking care of their infant and she had her lenses in and fell asleep and now she has an ulcer. So most patients are very contrite about what they did. And it's the old joke when the patient goes to the doctor and says, doc, it hurts when I do this. And the doctor says, well, then don't do that. Well, we know what's causing the ulcer. Don't sleep in your lenses. And so we try to tell them that. And when they come in, we have to analyze what's going on. And thankfully, where I practice or have practiced, I've only had to refer a handful of, of my patients out to a cornea specialist to do a culture or because the ulcer was right over the middle part of your eye. So we have our pupil and the iris. And if the ulcer is very large, covering the, uh, the center point of your vision, it's high chance it's gonna scar. So sometimes fortified antibiotics and other testing needs to be done so we can minimize that scar. And if it's something that's really um, longstanding, believe it or not, some patients will pump in um, uh, um, clear eyes or other products that will remove redness. So you think their eyes should be hot and red, 
but you see the ulcer and the eye looks kind of quiet. You're like, how is this possible? Well, then you ask the patient, yeah, I've been using Visine Doc because my eye's been red. And my, and my we collectively, I'm sure you've had patients like this, they will come in with a red eye, painful eye, light sensitive, and still have contact in their eye. What the heck is going on? Your eye is red. Why, Doc? Well, I have to wear my glasses. I don't want to wear my glasses. Well, you've now made it worse. When did this start? Oh, Friday, and they show up on Monday to your office. You wore your contact. Yeah, every day I put it back in, even though it was red. Yeah, I couldn't see you to Monday. So that's one of the things when I have a new fit, I make sure the staff and I also will try to make sure I make that last comment. If your eye ever gets red with the contact in, before you even call us, take your contact out. That's rule one. We'll address it after that. But patients are so in love with their contacts and hate their glasses that they're going to continue to wear their contact even though their eye is flaming red. You know, that's a great point. You know, I had yesterday, uh, my son plays baseball and one of the kids on his baseball team and I came in for contact lenses. And I tell this to every contact lens patient. If one day, whether it's tomorrow, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you're walking down the street and you ask yourself, should I wear this contact lens because it feels different? And you have to ask, and if you ask yourself that question, you take the contact lens out, put a new one in. If that, if you, if that one hurts as well, take it out and come immediately to see us. Never wear a contact lens that hurts even a little bit. Yeah, especially if you've been wearing lenses for a long time. And you know, I, I've seen a couple patients um, over the years who swear they didn't sleep in their contact. So maybe they didn't. Maybe it's just their long-term use. They were, again, camping or doing something. They went in a, uh, on a canoe trip, water. Um, I have personally never seen a canth amoeba. I'm very grateful that I haven't, but I know our colleagues have. And that's something that you know makes your, your forehead sweat a little bit when you think it might be that. You see that little bullseye and you're gonna go, uh-oh, this has got to get to a cornea specialist. But again, doing a proper case history. And for the patients who are listening to this podcast, be honest with your doctor. Don't, I know you're embarrassed to say, like when you go to your dentist and he says, well, do you floss every day? Well, that's another issue. But don't lie or don't mislead them by saying something that you're afraid they're going to get mad at you because that's just going to delay your recovery um, and let them know what eye drops you were using if you were trying to even, um, I don't know if you've had this one, Carrie, but I've had a couple patients say that they had either grandma's antibiotics from her cataract surgery, which are two years old, or my favorite one, my dog's antibiotic drops that the dog had. So don't do things like that. If you have a red eye, like Dr. Gelb said, take the contact out, but don't try to self-treat. Uh, make sure you come and see your eye care provider so they can properly analyze it. And even if, it, if you have to go to an urgent care, um, most urgent cares, at least in metro areas, have a slit lamp. Um, they don't have the training that an ophthalmologist and optometrist does, but you, you don't really want to keep the contact in. That's the, that's the key point here. And, you know, I think people have to realize when they're wearing contact lenses and if they overwear it, they get these little mechanical abrasions. And then uh, the, the bacteria could actually stick to back to the back of the contact lenses. And that's how you wind up with these bad infections. Oh, absolutely. And those are sneaky because again, it may feel like you mentioned earlier, like there's an edge to the lens. And I, I think the tip off for most patients when they finally say, I got to come see you is photophobia, light sensitivity. When they can't open their eye or, you know, even the crack of the, of the door or light under the door is causing them to, you know, have a lot of uh, epiphora or, or tearing, then that's the time that they know they have to come in. And before they get the corneal ulcer, there's something called superficial punctate keratitis or superficial keratitis. If you could explain that. So again, we're talking about the cornea. Keratitis means inflammation of the cornea in Latin. And so superficial, the top layer, punctate is little dots. And so when we put this stain in the eye, you can see it, the, doc the doctors can see it without stain. But when you stain, you can actually see the level and the depth of, there's many layers to the cornea. And that is kind of like uh, bumps. And those bumps will then rub against the lens. And you may, again, just tough it out and think it's not a big deal. 
And that's where, uh, as Dr. Gelb said, you're having this uh, continuous cycle and that's where the opportunistic pathogen comes in. You give it an opening and boom, it blossoms, it, it, it blossoms and, and flourishes. Kind of like if you got a cut on your hand and you're gonna maybe do some gardening. You don't wanna stick your hand in, in soil because potentially you could get infected. Put a Band-Aid on it. When you feel that way and you know that you're probably having a, a, an issue, take that contact out. And a red eye from a contact lens, you mentioned a little bit about it before, but go into a little bit more detail, what could cause that red eye from a contact lens? And is it, if you're wearing contact lenses and you get a red eye, is it always because of the contact lens? Oh no, it could be again, dryness, it could be allergies, especially here in Chicago right now with pollen and ragweed. Um, it can, uh, it's a multifactorial cause of, of redness. Um, you know, I, I've had patients um, get red eyes from, you know, something they're working in their, in their uh, workshop or fumes from um, maybe they were refurnishing uh, some wood and they, you know, had to use some kerosene or, or turpentine and that causes redness. There's all sorts of ways people can get uh, redness, but the redness with the pain and the photophobia or light sensitivity, that's the three strong hallmark for you to come in and see your eye care provider because those symptoms are not going to go away, even if you take your contact out. And how about excessive mucus production? Some people actually pull out stringy mucus or their eye is red and there's some mucus that actually could be an early sign of corneal ulcer, but could be other things. Yeah, it, it could be um, a vernal conjunctivitis or, or, or um, allergies related to the environment. Um, <clears throat> I, I believe it's uh, I'm going to say it was Paula Jamian, but it was, I remember a lecture, I think he calls that uh, fish stringing or, 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 or stringing for fish. There's a, a cute term he uses because people are pulling it out, you know, like they're, uh, like they're fishing for it. And the level of that- Mucus fishing told, syndrome? What's that? Mucus fishing syndrome? That's it. That's <laughs> it. I think it was a Jamian who coined that, or that's what I remember Paul <laughs> saying it to us in a lecture. But, you know, it's one of these things where they think it's going to go away and the for whatever reason, just too busy, lack of insurance, pick a reason, they don't come in and that's just gonna get worse. So that needs to be treated, especially if you're wearing contacts. And we talked a little bit about corneal edema, but sometimes we see these little tiny microcysts on the cornea on the front surface of the eye. If you could talk a little bit about that and what does that mean when you see that as a side effect to contact lenses? Well, it goes back to our first topic, I believe, hypoxia. I mean, we're, we're getting the layers of the cornea forming these little bubbles, and these bubbles are not only going to affect your vision, you won't see as well as you potentially would. Um, and, and let me step back for something. That's another key thing. When you have your contacts, and I'm telling you, please take your contacts out, put your glasses on. And if your vision is drastically different in one eye or both eyes, that's the microcyst edema. It's a multifactorial problem that if your contact is out and your glasses are now just as bad, that tells you the cornea, even with the glasses, is causing some changes and you need to see your doc. And then there's infiltrates, the accumulation of inflammatory cells. We should see it a lot before one day contact lenses. Yeah, and those, like you said, are, are much more diminished, but with infiltrates, typically they're on the margin of your eye. Um, they're, they're at, so again, the iris, the colored part of your eye, it's around that area. They typically don't move into the central aspect over the cornea, but it's something that your provider will look at and see if you're developing that. And then as we already talked about, switching the modality of your contacts. And typically when you see an infiltrate, how do you treat it? That depends upon how big it is, how bad the acuity drops, um, how long it's been there, or we can guess how long it's been there. Um, sometimes, you know, if it's not really uh, significant, um, I may not do anything. If it's something that the infiltrate, obviously, say out of your contacts, uh, we could use a, a topical drop. Um, I've never, that I can recall, ever used an oral medicine for an infiltrate. So it's frustrating for the patient, but also the provider, like how did it get there? It's never been there before. Um, and how do we make sure it doesn't come back, especially if it's a newer patient to your practice? 
Yeah, people over wearing their contact lenses and we see these little white spots, which is accumulation of inflammatory uh, uh, mediators on, uh, in, in the cornea, these inflammatory cells, probably white blood cells. And we used to treat them, you know, we used to see them all the time. We used to see one or two a week. Now, maybe I see one, one every six months and we would treat them usually initially with antibiotics and then antibiotics combination antibiotic steroids. Sometimes we start off with antibiotic steroids, but like you said, it, it depends on the patient. Let's go, let's move over to polymegathism where a different size of the endothelial uh, cells. Talk about that and as, as a side effect of context. Well, that's again, the cornea changing shape. Uh, and what it is, it's the, now we're talking about deeper into the cornea, not just the epithelium, which is more involved with uh, potential ulcers. So at the endothelium layer, uh, we, with special microscopes, can see the endo change. And those can be long standing. I mean, it, that could be uh, something that may even prohibit a patient from getting refractive surgery if they have long term damage to that. Um, I, again, have never seen that myself, but I know there's documented cases of patients not being able to continue to wear their contacts or having problems with their cornea because, again, they've overworn their lenses and they're not taking care of them uh, as they should. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromicell, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromicell technology. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. Each generation was supposed to be healthier than the last one. Lifespan was supposed to be increasing. We were supposed to be in this paradise by now. Instead of getting healthier and healthier, it seems to have gone the opposite way. Millennials were projected to be the first generation in history to not outlive the generation before them. We are certainly headed for disaster. I think a lot of people are beginning to question the whole story. We live in a time where the paradigms are shifting. And the optometrist, in my opinion, is one of the best kept secrets. The public doesn't realize about going to the eye doctor. So many different diseases actually manifest in the eye. The back of the eye is the only place in the body that you could actually see the blood vessels. Completely non-invasively, you could screen thousands of people, not just for their eye health, but for their whole body health. Because this disease is here, it's also gonna be here. And I can look into the back of my eyeball and there are expert doctors on the ground who are looking at my eyeball while I'm doing it. The eye is the canary of the mind. The eye is the kingdom. Will everyone please Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.